Good day, retrogrades and parish orphans. I think everyone out there now is understanding why I use this term parish orphans. I am joined by a special guest today, Mr. John Loudon, who was a uh, senator of Missouri from 2000 to 2008 for the 7th District. And before that, he'd been a Missouri House of Representatives representative from 1994 to 2000. We're going to do a deep dive into the BLM today. Everyone knows why that's relevant to me. John, how are you, sir? Why is it relevant to you? <laughs> Good, thanks. Uh, always uh, uh, a pleasure to, uh, you know, kind of expose the truth and uh, really, really uh, glad to be with you today uh, talking about one of the more critical issues of our time. And I'd say, first of all, it matters uh, because this is a group that's raising a tremendous amount of money. And uh, I think a lot of people of uh, good faith uh, see it as, uh, you know, some some rallying point to bring healing. Uh, but I don't see the agenda of this group about healing. I see the agenda of this group about making a lot of money and uh, and in their own words, uh, taking on the what the European family construct or something, you know, they 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 they. Uh, why on earth is their agenda LGBTQ and and uh, and breaking up the I guess the Western uh, style family structure? I I, I don't uh, see how that fits on uh, you know helping Black people to not be attacked by the police. Well, I did. I mean, as you I know you know you're, you're going to be you're going to be breaking things down for me and for my rules for retrogrades audience. Mm -hmm. I know you get it, but. Identity politics is all about the quickening um, political pace of rupture that goes along with Marxism, you know, that they eat their leaders alive. Look at look at Leon Trotsky. They use him for a while. And even a Trotsky isn't extreme enough to um, fit the pace of the revolution, which is ever quickening. So they, they chew him up, spit him out dead. This is, so the, the, the issue's never the issue. This is one of the rules for retrogrades. The last week I've been just using my book, 40 Rules for Retrogrades, to uh, get through my crisis uh, versus the B BLM. It works. I can tell people literally it works. You never back down. You're always on the gas pedal. You go against them. Don't apologize, you know, unless you do some serious sin or something but that's not what's at, at odds here it's not racist you you have you have confidence that you're not a racist and you keep it going let me show you this john this is my favorite paper i know people out here have heard of the epic times but even i was surprised to see i love this even epic times is saying things like antifa and other far left groups exploit protests for revolution even the epic times who seems to be a stalwart the, the new rising star of the print uh, world here in America is is um, calling them other far left groups. Why is that, John? Can you give us some insights? They're they're afraid. Uh, they're they're in exact violation of your rule. They really don't want to take this group that has become so powerful. I mean, who's Antifa? I, I just think everyone's everyone's kind of afraid to take them on. Oh, not everyone. Clearly, you aren't. <laughs> yeah, man. I don't. I mean, you take their heat and you're like, it ain't that hot. I mean, if you now there are people I spoke to a man this morning, not far out of my area, who I, I won't divulge too many details. That's that's taken the brunt of the mob. And he's saying, man, you know, you're doing it. It's it's not that bad, is it? It's like, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a sizable footprint um, you know, friends in the national media uh, attorney friends, so I can I can kind of handle it a little better. But what I want to do is provide a platform in the coming storm to other truth sayers who who might not have the same platform. But uh, yeah, I want to get to your your point about um, so so it's crystal clear because this is really the first full show I've done since I lost my job for opposing BLM. They are a Marxist front group, Soros, Soros backed. It's, that's not a conspiracy theory that's, that's out there. You can go read um, um, Soros's donations to the group. Clearly, were started by some, some uh, lesbian feminists who want to, as you say, disrupt the Western family structure, nuclear family structure. Why do they want to do it? Because with Marxism, the issue's never the issue. 
and it has nothing to do with its titular, uh, you know, situation with the title of the, the the group. It has more to do with, I'd say, BLM, its foundation in Missouri, and you're the perfect guy to talk to, right? Because you were you were there. Um, this was your it was your former district, right? The, mm-hmm. That you oversaw. Can, what can you tell us about the ideology, if we're going to use a doctor's term, of this thing, the the, the, cause, the root cause of BLM, historically? Yeah, well, you know, BLM is really uh, not new. They've just put a label on uh, something that's been going on for years. Um, and really, Jesse Jackson started it with Operation Push in Chicago. Um, they were they were ma- raising tons of corporate donations uh, to help uh, corporations with diversity training. And, and uh, the way it works is if you're not signing up for their programming, you might be the next target as a racist company. And uh, Al Sharpton came to St. Louis and shut down Interstate 70 uh, back in the late 90s because he, uh, the allegation was there was a big construction job going on and um, on Interstate 70, and there weren't a lot of black construction workers. He didn't see black faces. So there was this rallying cry to um, have the economy help black people, and and uh, you know certainly something everyone can support. Um, but what I found um, very telling was I was afforded an opportunity by being an elected official. Uh, to offer legislation. I wanted to amend a bill. They said, let's, let's have audits by the state to make sure that there are, uh, are proper use of minority set-aside um, contracts. So when you build a $100 million project, 15% or $15 million has to go to minority-owned contracting firms. Uh, I mean, I understand that. They've got uh, MBEs, Minority Business en- Enterprises, uh, WBE Women Business Enterprises and uh, and and the more generic uh, DBE Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. These are all uh, every anybody in public construction around the country is familiar with these. Um, what they did is they wow. said, "Let's audit the set asides and make sure that." We're meeting our numbers and the rallying cry of people, the local people, including uh, including Sharpton, would be, let's up the numbers, let's up the set aside, let's make it higher and higher. And, and I scratched my head because uh, during this time, we had a major uh, sports announcer. This guy, he was the number one sports guy in St. Louis, Malcolm Briggs, and then he moved to Anchor. And all of a sudden, he quits and he becomes a minority contractor. Somebody had told me at the time, and I'm not sure about it, but they said he was probably making around half a million dollars a year as a as a, a top celebrity and the peak of his game, and suddenly he's going to become a contractor. Wow. <laughs> so I offered legislation. I said, while we're auditing these things, um, my amendment said, let's audit uh, the complexion of the actual workers. Um, because what we have is a situation where there might just be because you're a minority owned business doesn't mean you aren't hiring workers um, that are all white uh, or, you know, there's kind of this racist assumption that if you're a minority owned business, you're going to hire only minorities. Uh, the, right. the fact of the matter is on the big public construction jobs, um, most of the workers are hired out of union hiring halls. So it doesn't matter whether the owner is black, white, or Asian, or Latino, um, you're, you're getting the same workers out of the union hiring hall without regard to race or ethnicity. And I, right. I hate the term race, so I'm just using it for expedience, but um, I, I think race is an artificial construct, but that's another episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. we're, all God, we're all God's children and uh, created his, in, in, in his image, so... Uh, I don't like that term race at all, uh, and I wish we were colorblind. Um, but in this case, um, I said, look, this is the argument of the day that we need to have black faces on work sites. The only way to assure that is to actually audit and make sure that the workers themselves are actually minorities. And, and um, I was stunned when my amendment was rejected on a straight party line vote, every single Democrat, including all the black Democrats, voted 
that they did not want the data of black faces on the work sites. They, they were just uninterested in that. And so I was stunned. Um, you know, I, I got accused of, uh, of uh, different motives. I said, well, you know, then you come up with better language. Uh, sure. And so that bill left the House. It went to the Senate. Without my language, the Senate bill came over from the Senate to the House, and I had a second opportunity to offer the same amendment, which I did, and I lost <laughs> again on a party line vote. So, um, did, can you distill that for us, John? What's yeah. I mean, you, you don't have to. Uh, you you can you can make some assumptions here. What what is going on? Why would the I don't like identity politics in the first place, right? So I I I don't think there's any place for. I mean, it's a whole different show. I, I don't think there's any place for, is it a, should we help a white business or black business? I, I, I'm truly colorblind. Just, you know, if I can't get one of these startup loans or whatever, you know, if I'm trying hard, then I, or, or the whatever, a Chinese American guy can't get it or a Mexican guy can't get it, then, then I don't like it. But the point is, I guess the people that like identity politics should like these, and they're the ones keeping the face off. What what's going on, and what does this have to do with the double, triple mirror of of um, identity politics, BLM type uh, finagling? Can you can you give us a yeah? You cut through all of it and tell us what you think that means because it's really weird. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a, a twofold functionality here. One is that the politically connected um, minorities, um, they're helping other politically connected minorities and, and uh, guy, people like this, this wealthy broadcaster is now a very successful minority contractor. You know what? He's not doing home editions. He's doing public projects where there are minority set-asides. You know, uh, yeah. he's not a, the custom home builder. And this is, this is the this is not what these programs are designed to do. They're designed to help the average black people. Why do we not have uh, have uh, black, inner city black politicians uh, as the most forceful advocate for school choice? What, what would help poor black communities more than school choice? And sure. so I'm I'm just having uh, just feeling like I'm the one advocating for black communities, despite the politicians they're sending. Um, was perplexing. Right. Uh, um, I was the one trying to get abortion clinics out of black communities. Um, you know, they're they're pushing abortion on their citizens. They're forcing them in failed government schools, not letting them out. Um, they're they're enriching the wealthy minority contractors, but not worried that those jobs are trickling down to the black faces uh, that Al Sharpton cried for. And and I just see the same thing with BLM now. What what are they after? What are they really about uh, to really help people? They're they're sure not running with Martin Luther King's dream of colorblindness of a colorblind society. They're all, all about color. Even even this just stunning assertion that if you say all lives matter, if you're truly pro life and you want everybody, uh, all God's children, to do well. You're a racist. <laughs> that's yeah, that, that, look, that's it's safe to say that that notion of colorblindness as the the leading mantra or or what have you of of civil rights. I guess the post civil rights movement it died in the nine in the early nineties. I think identity politics won out, and I think there's an office episode. It might be in season one where Michael Scott goes through diversity training. Mm -hmm. And they, the, the way that entertainment media lays out the, the goals of the news media, there's a character that gives voice to it really perfectly. Michael Scott, I think, even says, oh, colorblind, right? And, and the character, uh, Mr. Brown, says, no, uh, that's, that's not really what we say anymore. That's, that's, that's kind of old. That's the old civil rights. Mm -hmm. The new civil rights is, is not colorblind, you know. We're, we're back to you know all all uh, snowball and Napoleon from from Animal Farm. All all pigs are equal pigs, except some are more equal than others. Yeah, that's identity politics pretty clearly. Now identity politics, with with stunning uh, success, is dictating that that black people are going up to white people and saying, um, "Bow to me," or or like like do this. Uh, 
prostrated expression of mm. worshipfulness. And yeah. if you don't, you're a racist. And Big dumb, thing. foolish, cowardly, suburbanite type, yellow belly white people are going for it. Right, they're they're falling for it, and they're they're doing this worshipful act of other people. It's the snowball and Napoleon movement. This is what's behind Black Lives Matter, right? Reestablishing a race order, a race hierarchy, just putting black on top, isn't it? It, it certainly, it certainly uh, is what it feels like, or or it, it, it and it all comes down to uh, an electoral politics game. If if you can keep you keep that base fired up and angry and and keep pointing to the demon on the other side then we don't judge them i mean look at just just look at the absurdity uh that going to ferguson missouri missouri or uh minneapolis um they have a hard leftist mayor a black police chief a democrat hard left democrat governor a, a democrat hard left city council is going to defund the police and they're out there rallying against systemic racism. Well, who are the systemic racists? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just that run your city? And right. it was identical in Ferguson. Ferguson was almost worse. Ferguson, Missouri, um, you had a Democrat governor. One of the two U.S. senators happened to be a Republican. But you had a Democrat U.S. senator who had little jurisdiction in the matter. But yeah. you had a Democrat governor a black Democrat member of Congress, a black Democrat state senator, a black Democrat state rep, a black Democrat county councilwoman, a black Democrat county executive. Um, right. The only person that wasn't black or Democrat in the picture was the nonpartisan mayor who happened to be white, who had absolutely nothing to do with what happened. They, they are decrying the systemic racism in Ferguson, Missouri, when this is like the most ethnically diverse uh, community in St. Louis. Uh, yeah. People love Ferguson. The Ferguson residents did. Um, the police chief, um, I knew him as Captain Jackson back in the day. Uh, his wife was an older woman. Um, they were very committed uh, to the community. I believe when he became chief, she stepped aside as older woman. That wouldn't have been probably really appropriate. Um, but uh, Captain Jackson and his wife, Pat, great people committed to that community. Um, there was no systemic racism. And you can, you can make statistics say whatever you want. But the reality is that, uh, that people all around Ferguson, Missouri, and other communities were fleeing property values declining. Ferguson is a community that we should that the nation should be celebrating as diverse where people weren't fleeing you know they call it white flight that's a very uh, uh, convoluted term the truth the, the truth of the matter the sociologists will tell you economically pe the, the people who flee are people black white Asian whoever can when there's a perception that crime's a problem um, the values are going to decline. But Ferguson is a community where nobody fled. And I can say this firsthand because I lived, I lived in the more uh, far-flung, white, um, affluent, more affluent part of the county. And I, had, I knocked on doors to people, black and white, who had left what we call in St. Louis, North County. They'd left other parts of North County. I never met anybody who, who um, fled. And people were moving into Ferguson. And uh, they burned Ferguson for purely political uh, motives and uh, it's terrible um, how that narrative was flipped upside down and the skullduggery involved by uh setting up a group of people with arson for, to, to be the to be the false uh, uh perpetrators of arson is so outrightly neronian right nero did this to christians and jews in the trastevere neighborhood of rome in like 67 a.d it's actually where i nearly uh Nearly had a had a home in Rome before I decided to take a an apartment in San Lorenzo in East Rome. But um, it's incredible that we're even talking about. Well, that this was a, a crass political motive for setting the fire. There's no good reason for arson, right? Um, that so that's one point. Secondly, I want to go back to something really, really important that you said about probably 90 seconds before you stopped talking. Okay, you said. Uh, tutti, tutti copy, right? All of the heads of these these Democrat towns, a lot of them that we, we're seeing on the news now, 
like Ferguson almost 10 years ago were, or were run by, by black people. Um, the institutional racism that we're hearing about involves a policy agenda that um, pretty much nationally involves a kind of black privilege in terms of standardized test scores. You know, the, 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 uh, you can go and look at what the average accepted graduate student is department by department, school to school. You have to make lower scores to make it into most graduate departments on the GRE, on the LSAT, right? That's that's a kind of privilege. I, I, tests are hard. I I spent you know most of my twenties in grad school with 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 little kids and and a wife, and I would have loved to have not had to study so hard on the test, take a lower score, and still get in. Um, in um, instead, you're talking about business loans and and startup. You know, I guess it's public monies that are set asides for that are outlays for for you if you are a black person. How, if all of the politicians setting the policy agendas are black, the policy agenda favors blacks and the even even um, ancillary issues like educational policy agenda favors black. How are we talking about a white privilege at all? I, I, I really I really don't understand how a person with a brain can look at this and come away and say there's such a thing as white privilege. Yeah, well, and, and I left a very important politician out in all that mix of uh, the black politicians in charge of Ferguson. Uh, the president was black. Barack Obama uh, was overseeing Ferguson during all this time. Um, True. Sent 40 FBI agents to get to town. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling. Give us lots of money. Um, we're going to fight. We're going to fight with, uh, you know, oblique political demands. And uh, and yet, when it comes to doing the basic systemic change, um, building strong communities, giving choice, uh, school choice to poor people. You know, my mother taught in the inner city in St. Louis, not just in the inner city itself, but she was a special ed, Title IX teacher. Um, she was she was that teacher that homes the garage sales uh, for for school supplies because her kids didn't have any. You know, she was dedicated 15, 20 years. It was a later in life career. She went back into teaching after raising four sons. And uh, she took her privilege straight to the city of St. Louis to help the poorest of the poor black kids um, to, uh, to, to have a chance. And, uh, you know, when, when you look around and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the black principal seems to have less compassion for these kids than you do. Um, she's given up. Um, and you've right. got right next door, right across the street, there's a, there's a Catholic uh, you know, school of the archdiocese that would take these kids and love them. It, it just, to me, if, they're, if, uh, if, if Black Lives Matter was out there saying we need to uh, get abortion clinics out of uh, our black neighborhoods, um, that would show me that they really think Black Lives Matter. Of if course, they, if they were saying we should we should be giving vouchers to every poor black kid, um, then I'd believe that they really thought Black Lives Matter. Uh, if they were focusing on uh, on the street gangs, um, then I think they really that kill hundreds a day, um, you know, lives, generations thrown away. Then I'd believe that they really thought Black Lives Matter. Oh, certainly. When look, this is what identity politics, which is just Marxism, does. Uh, you, you sent me an article from 2015, uh, the Washington Compost, <laughs> who who covered the movement, the kind of osmosis, if you will, of the Black Lives Matter movement from the streets, which I don't believe it was generated there in in the grasses roots to the university, which is probably where it was cooked up in the first place anyway, when you look at the real generation. But but Washington Post covers a narrative that it moved from the streets into the university. That's where it was given some more teeth, in, in, intellectual teeth. That's where it was given uh, backward slanting shark's teeth, you know, with tricks. Because mm -hmm. the university professors are all Alinskyites. They're, they're weaponizing the things that they touch. Uh, they're weaponizing the ideology and making it more than just a kind of movement of the street, if it was ever that. So I, I believe that there's, if we can zo um, zoom out a little bit to the national level now, 
Why are the, uh, I mean, it's a weaponized, they, you, they play on weaponized ambiguity. You, you made mention of the obliqueness in, in the Catholic circles where I travel. We call this weaponized ambiguity. Monsignor Charles Pope coined this term for the way that uh, Pope Francis operates. He uses weaponized ambiguity where you're going to, you put a term out there, the masses become inoculated to it, um, to hearing the term, you know, in terms of not having an allergic reaction to it. And then you implement it in ways that are different from the innocuous, uh, ostensible response it should produce in the mind and the breast of the hearer or whatever. That seems to be the the worldwide globalist Marxist uh, number one play in the you know secularists included, Black Lives Matter included. You and I spoke before uh, rolling cameras here. Why are Americans? watching at night or at least the last two weeks they're watching on their tv screens you know murdering uh grand larceny uh larceny at a high scale with what's what the media is calling looting Mm -hmm. um arson and um police officers being targeted targeted for murder in the name of a premise that you brought this up in the name of ferguson that there's a systemic problem now, when you look to the facts, nine police off, uh, nine unarmed black men were killed by police officers last year. Nine unarmed does not mean unjustified. One, maybe two of them. I've had a look at it. Look unjustified. It could be, uh, you know, ninety. The, the numbers far higher for for whites that were killed that were unarmed by police officers. So there's not a systemic problem, right? I mean, that, that, that if there's one unjustified killing, that's horrible. But there are, that's like saying too many people die at the claws of grizzly bears each year. It's like we want it to be zero. But systemically, they, they, you know, you, you can't bring all tragedies to zero number. It's, it's an a- occupational hazard, what have you. So why are Americans by nightfall seeing the pillaging and plundering and killing in the streets by this Marxist, Soros front group, and then by day going to their water cooler uh, talks and listening idly as, you know, soft-bellied kind of radicalized moderates talk at their, you know, oil and gas job, non-cutting edge job. These are non-radicals discussing over, you know, lunch or whatever, hearing something that so utterly contradicts such a non-concomitant of what they saw on the TV last night, and they're just smiling and nodding in this conversation that doesn't at all match. There's no um, compatibility with what we're all seeing on the TV screens. The characterization is so utterly off. What's mm-hmm. going on? You have special, uh, you have a special experience with this, but what's going on at the national level? Why are so many Americans falling for this BLM uh, embrace. People are driven by their basis the most. And it's the challenge. To me, it's a duty of uh, citizens, of, of Christians, to uh, be driven by higher emotions. Right. Um, and one of the most base emotions is uh, is to get along with the crowd. And uh, we, we don't want it. Nobody wants to be ostracized of about any species. And uh, I think most people just settle that, hey, I'd rather... Be quiet and go along with the crowd. Then I'll be more in with the crowd. I was uh, watching uh, George Floyd's second funeral in North Carolina, and uh, and they were they were they had already forewarned that there was going to be the next funeral in Texas, and uh, and I was surprised Fox News is giving wall to wall coverage. And I thought, okay, um, we celebrated his life and. Minnesota, we've we've called for action. We need to do that three times, um, four times. You know what? What's the next? And I'm just I'm very curious that we've got somebody's funeral. I'm just trying to think of a war hero that had more than one funeral um, right. that was nationally televised. Um, and uh, so I flipped channels. CNN wasn't covering it. Um, hmm. MSNBC, they were all. They were out on the streets doing reporting of the of the protests. You know, this happened to be during the day, mostly nonviolent at the time. I wonder if this is some kind of virtue signaling or trying to be popular um, or appease uh, 
the movement that uh, that that they're uh, they're covering the funeral. They care, right? Yeah, this is. We also talked about this phenomenon in the kind of center right uh, man's. I guess it's his will, not his intellect. Maybe maybe it's his intellect and his will. He thinks. Look, that these are the bull- these are the bullies in the lunchroom, um, and at the university they hard they soft wired this plan where they could be the bullies by saying that they're the victims. This is the Alinskyism, mm-hmm. um, but these are the bullies, right? That are going around, essentially making protection style demands like the mob, and saying in the name of you know us, the victims, blacks, we're, we're, we're going to go around, we're going to demand, make these demands of all the networks, make these demands of the American people that they literally kneel to us like gods, or else we call them racist. And in the, it's a problem of the few and the many. In the minds of 95% of the people, it's not more than elegant than middle school. They're just like, oh, here, here's my money, uh, lunchroom bully, instead of what works. Punch the bully hard in the mouth twice, right? Swift, sudden, I mean, this is m- partly metaphorical. Swift, mm-hmm. sudden action, then you just walk away. You will never get touched by the bully again. Swift, sudden, uh, you know, military initiative. It works. Innate, uh, you know, sort of uh, interior reaches is where you have to go to talk to somebody that's like, that's it, man. That's it. That's it. This audience likes hearing me talk that way. Aaron mm-hmm. rules for retrogrades. And they know what happened to me. Right. I'm just for saying, hey, uh, FBI designated BLM a BIE in 2017, a black identity extremist movement. And they are a terror threat. Got fired for that last week. This is the first full show we've done since then. You know, I'm going to keep talking, man. That's what I do. You never back down. You never pull a gutless, toothless, heartless Drew Brees and back down and say, sorry, because they don't. The left doesn't want it anyway. They're devils. They're devils. The le- I mean, this is what the, the Marxist radicals are. They're, they're devils. They want to de- uh, they, they hate Christendom. They want to de-Christianize the West. They've already mostly succeeded. And the moderates just follow the devils in, in this weird setup we find ourselves in in America in 2020. So never apologize. Just don't mm-hmm. apologize. And people are like, man, that's cool. I mean, people literally come up to me. That's cool. You said that. I'm like, it's just common sense, man. It's all just middle school. And mm-hmm. I, I think you're right. You're one of the only people that I've talked to about this that had kind of your own theory that I that I like as to why people are so cowardly that we are mammals. Right. I mean, we're Christ was fully God and fully man. But we the part of us that is man being human, we're mammals and mammals are a herd animal. And instead of being called to the familial individualism, the religious individualism required to do the right thing in a, in a pretty wicked culture. Um, most of these mammals, even the ones calling themselves Christians, are just covering their ribs and going along with, with the, the herd in the way that you, you said. And it's tremendously unsuccessful. Is, I mean, can we, can we pause there on how unsuccessful it is? The principle is what matters, right? I owe it mm-hmm. before my creator, before Christ, to just, I got to do the right thing, even if it's scary. That's a principle. That's the sin. That's the idea of the thing, the formal platonic element. But even if I were just a cowardly pragmatist, it's also, it doesn't work, Drew Brees, does it? Can we talk about how unsuccessful a tactic that is, John? Yeah, yeah. It's, that, I have to say, that was, that was disappointing. Uh, that was really disappointing because... Uh, we all know from grade school, you, you give in to the bully. Too many Americans just seems, and I'm not sure it's an American problem. Maybe it's worldwide. We just let ourselves be bullied, and uh, and and we don't um, call down the bully. And when you you know when you appease, jeez, uh, we just you know we thought we thought we learned that uh, when when Ronald Reagan refused appeasement, said no, uh, this is going to end one way: we win, they lose. Um, you know, he knew he was on the side of, of virtue and righteousness and, and uh, free people, free to worship and free to speak. Uh, and so he had to crush the uh, Soviet Union economically, and he did so. But when it's race in America, this is our, our you know, our underbelly, and race has no place. I've said this to, all, you know, the alt-right. It's, I think, rule number 38 in Rules for Retrogrades. Racism has truly no quarter in, in the new American right the re-Christianizing American right, 
wing that that, that I imagine that others are 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 concocting up. Um, mm -hmm. So race, but except, but at the same time, so no racism, but no identity politics, and no apologizing for things I didn't do. Look, a bill of attainder, people, which we kind of hear about in middle school civics, and we don't know what it is. This is being punished for. You know, if your father's a, a murderer, you, he can get a tainter on his family. They can't own property. No bills of a taint. I'm, I, I owe no one any apologies for racism of the past. For, for Even if I have a great, 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 great grandfather that, that did something racist, I'm, I, don't, I don't apologize for it. Not a bit. Any more than a, a black guy now uh, owes me an apology for if his great, 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 great grandfather committed a crime against my great great grandfather. I, I don't care, and and it's it's kind of like there's a sharp divergence among people my age. You know, you know, in their thirties or twenties, it's like racism. It, it's not institutionally vested anymore at all. So we're not afraid of it. It's like I'm so not that sounding like Michael Scott. I'm so not that way that I. You can call me whatever you want. And the new I have the newspaper here on my hometown paper, man, right yeah. here front. Page. I left town. Front page. That's me. Bakersfield, yeah. California. They're calling, they're howling for my blood in the city. And, and I'm a Catholic school. I was theology department chairman. And I, you know, said nothing racist. Just said BLM's a terrorist organization. Uh, we need to rise up and not and, and say no to this. And they call me a racist. And I, I don't, don't care. And I won't back down. And I can't back down. John Loudon state senator and representative from the state of Missouri. Your time has been incredibly valuable with me here today on our deep dive into the BLM as it relates to its formation in Ferguson, Missouri. So I really appreciate your time and people will notice I'm, I'm not a shapeshifter. <laughs> I switched shirts here. Uh, we were having uh, connectivity problems throughout this whole interview. John and I have spoken afterwards. So it's actually a different day. And uh, he okayed me to just go ahead and put this up. We had a sudden um, impactful connectivity issue after having several small ones throughout the course of that interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's really, really important that uh, people out there get this information. John Loudon knew about the Black Lives Movement uh, terror org in their inception. And, you know, so hopefully you guys have a better feel for what they were about uh, five years ago here today. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Please, if you do support my case and, and my, not, not just my specific uh, court case or litigation or anything like that, but I mean, just my family's plight, everyone knows who's a viewer about Abby and my recent firing and all that, you can go to timothyjgordon.com and help in any way you see fit. If you need something tangible, for your uh, dollars, then please just purchase Rules for Retrograde's book, which I've been using every step of the way for the last week and a half since the radicals doxed me and struck me at my workplace. Rules for Work, this is the way that you come out on the other side clean with a non-sellout product, with a non-weak, uh, feckless-looking conservative viewpoint, is just by following it. Never give in. Uh, always be on the offense. Circle the wagons around other conservatives. Never cede an inch to the radicals. Those are just a few of them. And of course, there's no room for real racism uh, in the new American right wing that, that I'm trying to sort of help to found. And, you know, we'll see how this comes out. But either way, we'll go down fighting and we'll do so using the rules for retrogrades, the 40 rules. So uh, you can get that on... Uh, Tan Books' website, or you can get it on Amazon if you want to go through one of the evil corporations. And that that helps out my family as well to have the books selling well. They've been selling extremely well since this all happened. Nevertheless, John Loudon, a good man, uh, one of the fighters, one of the good guys. You can see he was in, uh, you know, Missouri on the right side when these events were fresh when they were uh, these foundational events when they were first taking shape and uh, I really uh, benefit from uh, hearing about his experiences there when Black Lives Matter was was uh, an unknown to us since then it's become a more common household name 
and it's been something like inoculated in in the popular eyes and ears and that's what we're seeking to do away with it is a terrorist org and christians of all denomination cannot be friendly with black lives matter forget the name go to the mission statement which is evil 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 john loudon thank you very much and uh rules for retrogrades fans out there parish orphans <laughs> coronavirus riot shut-ins you guys stay strong keep the fight we'll be back with you next week and I'll, I'll be making some more major media appearances on bigger platforms than my own stay tuned and please always keep the fight <laughs>